Hello, hi there, and welcome to part three of the Decentralized Communications uh, presentation series that we have been doing the last couple of weeks with Josh Dawes. Josh, how are you going? Hey, hey. Uh, yeah, going pretty well. I'm looking forward to this one. Good, good. Yes, we're getting stuck in with round three. I, I actually lost count. You know, I was, I was when I was doing all the posts. I was like, is it third? So I feel like it's fourth. I like, know it's definitely, it's definitely the third one. Um, but awesome. I am very, very ready, very excited. Um, welcome everybody in the chat that's that's coming on in now. Um, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and sticking around for our for our wonderful series, um, it has been great to um, to yeah share all this information and um, make it accessible and make it interactive with the community um, and get your input live while while we're chatting about it. Um, so it's been really really uh, wonderful. Getting some GMs in the chat here. Hi hello hi hello. Good morning good afternoon good evening good night. Cool, cool, made it. Amazing. Good to see you guys. Yes. How's your week been, Josh? Has it been a good one? Yeah, it has been pretty good. Um, it's been quite a busy one, but I think it's been a good thing. Lots of progress. Yeah. Yeah, lots of talking, actually, you know, like working together with different teams and, and figuring out, what, you know, how it all fits together, which is always fun. Yes. Um, yeah. Good, good. Nice. Awesome. Oh, everyone's already asking for alpha. I'm like, no, <laughs> not yet, please. No alpha hunting here. Um, awesome. Yeah, no, it's been a very busy one for me as well. Lovely short week, which we always, you know, that's always preferable. Um, so yeah, but it's been it's been really really busy. And next week is just going to be hectic, but we shall see on Monday. It's going to be a moment. Um, but yes, hello everybody, welcome, welcome. Um, ready, ready for today. Um, got me Friday brain on, I'm like ready for the weekend. So yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, cool, give awesome. me a highlight of your week in the chat, hey? How's how's your week been? Has it been, been good? Has it been wonderful? Tell me a highlight. We ready for Halloween? We've got our Halloween costumes happening. Or maybe we don't do Halloween. That's that's also fine. Have you what? Have you got a um, any plans, Josh? Are you going going out, going away? Uh, no, not not huge plans. We do we did sort the candy out. That was important. We're in an apartment, so I doubt we're going to get anybody, but we are prepared. Yeah. Got something on hand. You can't give out mandarins on Halloween. That's just not right. So no. No. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be good to have Halloween because last year we were in a very long lockdown. So there was none of that, you know, no Halloween parties, no trick or treating, absolutely not. Um, so it's like, Oh, I've forgotten how to do it. How do you, how does one Halloween? Um, yeah, it's kind of weird to, to remember that. Right. But yeah, so much is coming back in now. Yeah. It'll be a bit of an old experience and you're all going on. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot that that didn't happen last year, but then, yeah, a memory came up of me like being in lockdown last year, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's right! This was the time. This was the, this was the yeah. moment." Those, those little memories things are always such a mixed bag, eh? You, yeah. you get back and you're like, "I didn't really want to remember that, but thanks, I guess." Yeah, I'm like triggered. <laughs> Can you block all memories yeah. from the past two years? Thank you very much. I would oh, be happy. Routine. yeah 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 definitely definitely um if you if you haven't thought of uh if, if maybe you don't dress up for Chris, uh, christmas for halloween um but uh you want to and you want to be encouraged to do so um over on the seekers discord at the moment we are running a competition to see your furry friends in their halloween cozies so um dress your cat dog your bird maybe josh up post it uh in our discord and you could win some fantastic prizes um that was totally an ulterior motive to see all of your pets i'm just like yeah <laughs> it was a great excuse to to see people's fur babies i was like please go to our discord do that that would be wonderful um so yeah 
there is there is a bit of, bit of that <gasps> there's a good idea in the chat there josh should put a toucan bill on his bird i think she'd probably just eat it that's what she does with most things it's gonna be really hard to keep a costume on her for more than like 10 seconds yeah but, uh, maybe yeah. Try. yeah my dog had a costume once uh for he always gets christmas costumes um just to inflict a little bit of yeah like cruelty onto him and the the cutest one is like this one that looks like a uh an elf it's like a little elf suit so cute that one is my favorite um and he just looks so uncomfortable in it he's just like but yeah so it's a bit of that um but anyway enough chit chat i digress i you know i get i get excited about the talk of fur babies so i must bring myself in um uh we've hit the six minute mark we've 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 given you time to to come on in so i think that we are we're about ready to to head on into round three what do you what do you think josh what do you think chat are we are we ready for part three i'm excited let's do this i'm very excited yes so um um, as you know, the last two chats were about, um, you know, decentralized comms, centralized comms, exploring the ins and outs. And now we are ready to crack on in to round three. Everybody give it up for Josh Chainsaw Doors. <laughs> Make it away. Um, ah, perfect. See the slides now. Nice. Um, do the usual spiel to start with, I guess. So, hello, um, my name's Josh. If you're new, um, I work at Silo doing sort of uh, tokenomics and um, Silo network related things. Um, so, I've got a background in uh, engineering and applied math, and that's led me into the crypto space. So, that's the sort of stuff that I do. Um, the usual disclaimer as well. So like what I'm going to talk about today are the things, sort of the way that I understand things. Um, and it's not that these ideas are necessarily correct or like the only way to see what I'm talking about, but I find that they're like a helpful lens to, to use when understanding this sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to try and do a few pauses just to check in and see how, um, how the chat's going because I can't see it when I'm presenting. So, um, Monty, if you want to yell out with any cool questions that you see at those pauses, um, that'd be cool. And if there aren't any, we'll just we'll carry on. Yeah, okay. So, jumping into the content now, I suppose we should do a bit of a recap of the first two talks. Um, there's a fair bit there, so I would recommend watching them to get the most out of this one. But if you haven't already, um, basically, they explored the different ways that you can do um, communications uh, between computers, you know, messaging or um, calls or anything like that, and social media, all of that stuff is broadly communications. Um, and in particular, at the end of the second talk, we were exploring um, how peer-to-peer -peer communications were very good for privacy, but they have some user experience problems um, that you can solve with um, something called a decentralized service. Um, and one of the issues is that somebody has to be willing to provide that service. So today, what I'm hoping to look at is recapping those, uh, that idea of decentralized services in a bit more detail, um, and then understanding how we can encourage more people to provide that service so that peer-to-peer -peer apps can be as good and high performance and have a good user experience as their um, centralized alternatives, you know, so that they can compete on a, a level playing field. Um, so yeah, we're, we're gonna be talking about uh, system design, like the design of these decentralized services and the systems they work with. Um, and also we're gonna be talking about um, incentivization and sort of the decision that people make when they want to run one of these services and what the pros and cons might be, the sort of trade-off that they're making. Um, that's the sort of stuff we're gonna talk about today. Um, yeah, so let's get to it. 
So I'll start with a bit of a, a reminder of the specific decentralized service that we talked about last time. So we introduced this idea called Event Relay. Um, and this is essentially a extra component to a peer-to-peer -peer system that solves exactly the issues that peer-to-peer -peer messaging faces and nothing else. So it does sort of the bare minimum required to make peer-to-peer -peer work well um, without compromising privacy and without storing any information about you permanently. Um, so this sort of works by having, rather than a centralized database of all of your information, like the history of all of your Facebook posts, all that the event relay service stores is messages that are sort of in flight. So they're between the sending device, in this case, Monty's phone, and my device. Um, and again, recapping, the reason that this is good is that it solves two problems. So there's the issue that Monty and I might not be online at the same time, which is called the sync problem. So essentially, the messages that are in flight can just wait here in the center um, until I turn, turn up. Um, and they also solve the discovery problem, which is about Monty's device and knowing where on the network my device is and being able to actually get those messages to me. Um, so in that way, this service gets you to this sort of peer-to-peer -peer plus kind of system, which has all the performance of a centralized approach, but also is private and secure and all that good stuff. So that's why this is cool. Um, we're going to talk about this decentralized service specifically, but a lot of what I'm going to say applies to uh, more broadly to any kind of decentralized service that you might think about. Um, other projects as well, so it might be a useful lens for understanding those. We don't need to worry too much about the details yet, but we might get into those in, in a, a little bit. Um, so the thing, I'll, I'll come back quickly. The thing that we have to think about now is that somebody has to provide this service. Someone has to say, I'm going to set up a computer that's going to be running this service and it's going to be listening for messages from senders, and it's going to be waiting until receivers turn up to claim those messages. So in order to provide this service, there needs to be a computer that's on and sort of active and listening and ready to communicate with anybody who shows up. Um, and a human has to organize that. They've got to pay the power bill or rent that computer, um, and then they've also got to maintain it and make sure that it's working and keep an eye on it, essentially. So we can look at those service providers, the people who are running this service, and think about what motivates them. You know, there's plenty of decentralized services out there that work quite well based on people voluntarily doing this for the good of the network. And so if we understand why those systems work and what motivates those people will have a useful way of thinking about how to uh, grow a network in general, right? With understanding the motives of these people leads us to a good way of thinking about scalability. Um, yeah, so then let's get into it. So I think, I think the main two reasons that you would want to do this are basically selfless. They're sort of altruistic, good for the community, good for the world, good vibes kind of reasons, you know. People do this because they realize that they're enabling people, to, other people to communicate privately and, you know, achieve the goal that the, the system they're part of is achieving. So maybe if we take a separate example to messaging, people who are seeding on BitTorrent um, might be an example of people who are providing that service. You know, you can, you can use this lens on a bunch of different systems, but the, the common thread is that they're generally wanting to make the world better for other people. And they also like the idea of contributing to something like a community or a, a vision that's that's bigger than you know, just, just them and what they're doing. Um, and those are pretty powerful motivators. But the, the trouble comes that there are also concrete costs associated with doing this. So again, in, in order to run that service, you either need to own the computer it's running on or maybe rent it off of like Amazon Web Services, something like that. Um, and then on top of that, you also need to keep an eye on the service and make sure it's still running correctly. So that's a time cost. Um, and
and these factors kind of trade off in the heads of the people who are thinking about running these services and enabling these systems to work. Um, you can sort of understand this is almost like a scale. So if this is the, the fulcrum that it all balances on, every individual has something like this going on inside their head, whether or not they're actually providing the service. So they're, they're thinking about doing it and they go, well, these are the good things, you know, the world will be better, I'll be contributing to, to a community, and they're weighing that up against the, the costs associated with that. Um, and depending on the person, they'll tip one way or the other, right? Um, so every person is going to have different weights on each side of the scale, you know, different technical backgrounds, different financial situations, outlook, all that sort of stuff. Um, but any person can be sort of thought about in this way. It's just a matter of how important they rate each of these components. Um, and so it sort of follows from that, that if we want more of these decentralized services to be running, we've got to influence this, this weighing up of the options, right? This trade-off. We want to make it so that things tip to the left on the screen and, and this side wins out, because then more people will provide the service and we'll be able to do private communication at scale using these decentralized services. And so to do that, we are going to use the idea of incentives. Um, so this is a concept from economics and you can define it quite formally, but I think the simplest way to sum it up is that um, it's about changing the trade-off. It's about changing this balance by either adding benefits to the side or removing costs to that side uh, from that side so that it's a better deal to do this one. It's a, the goal of incentives is to change people's behavior by changing how they feel about the decision itself, right? You want to make it better for them um, to do one thing than the other. Um, and so incentives can be uh, done in two ways. So let's, let's take an example. Maybe we want to reduce the number of cars that are parking in the city center. Um, you could try and incentivize less parking by giving out vouchers for public transport. That would be a positive incentive. Or you could fine people for parking or maybe increase the parking costs of parking on the street, right? And that would be a negative incentive. Um, and it's important to notice with the negative ones that even though there is a cost attached, people don't have to pay that cost. So often, if, for example, parking on like dotted lines where you're at the league, where it's illegal to park, the fine acts as a deterrent and very few people end up paying that fine, but everyone's behavior still changes. So you don't necessarily need to be penalized by an incentive for that incentive to change your behavior. If you know about it, you can sort of plan around that and um, it all ends up working out. So that's, that's like an overview of incentives from sort of a, a theory perspective. Um, and what we're going to get to next is applying that to um, event relay. But I think that might be a good pause point just to see if there's anything in the chat that's, that's a good question based on that. What do you think, Monty? Can you see anything people want to ask? Yeah, uh, there are no um, questions in the chat yet, but if anybody wants to pop anything there at the moment, I'll give you a couple of seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Nope, I think we're good. If, if anything comes up, I will I will pop my face up again and say that yeah. there as well. Cool. All right, that sounds good. Yeah, okay, so that's that's the groundwork. Um, so with Event Relay, what do we actually want to incentivize? What's, what's the outcome that we're trying to achieve with these incentives? Um, and I suppose the key thing here is that this node has to be quite reliable to actually improve the user experience of, um, of a decentralized app. So this sort of works by Monty sending that message and it's holding and waiting here for a while before I eventually arrive and collect it. If Monty tries to send it and the service isn't online, 
then this doesn't work. And if I try and claim it and the service isn't online, this also doesn't work. So the performance of this node, of this relay service node in the middle here, ends up being very important to how effective the service is at improving the user experience of a peer-to-peer -peer app. And so it's not enough just to incentivize people to have and run these nodes. We also need to tie the incentives directly to how well they're doing their job um, so that you get this decentralized infrastructure that's highly reliable and useful that apps want to build on top of because they know that they can trust it. And that ends up being to everybody's benefit because if the network's reliable, then it gets a lot more traffic and you know, there's this sort of virtuous cycle going on, which we'll, we'll get into more detail about soon. So in, in particular, we want to incentivize the relay service to be high performance. And you can quantify that in a bunch of different ways. There's the concept of uptime, which is just what percentage of the time can you actually reach the service across the internet. If the computer was off, then it wouldn't be online. And so it's just about how much the service is online. Um, it's important that even when there's a lot going on, the service is responsive. Like if it takes 10 seconds before your message reaches the front of the queue that the service is holding, because there's lots of other traffic, that's also not very good. So it needs to be quite responsive. Um, the service also needs to have high throughput so that it can uh, help out many different centers and receivers at the same time, that's desirable. Um, and because this service is storing in-flight messages, it needs to store them for long enough that they get claimed. Um, you know, like maybe my phone's off for a couple of days. Um, it's good if that message is still there even after a couple of days rather than like the service deleting it after an hour. So these are all aspects of how the service works that you want to be able to uh, directly reward when they, the service does it well so that it ends up providing that good user experience. And then other than these technical performance goals, you want the incentives to allow the network to scale. You, you want supply and demand for the service to automatically balance. Um, so that means that when more people demand the service, it's a better deal to supply it, essentially. You want there to be this nice link between the number of people who are willing to help out and the number of people who want to, to use the service. Um, and finally, there's this idea of longevity. So because we're trying to make a decentralized service here, it's really ideal if the service is essentially, uh, it doesn't really matter who's providing it. So each, each provider is more or less interchangeable with the others. Um, and if, if you design it in that way, it means that you could have a completely different set of individuals providing the service and everything would still work. And you don't have any kind of dependence on its current participants. And I think that's an important property for decentralized systems it's because they need to include anybody and everybody. They have to work like that. You can't have anyone in a privileged position with more responsibilities. Um, yeah, so those, those are the goals of incentivizing the service. That's what we're trying to achieve. So this is where things get a little more technical. And I've tried to keep this talk at a fairly digestible level with the real details coming in the fourth one. But it would definitely help if we clear up any misunderstandings or miscommunications from me at this point before we go into the, the tough stuff. Um, so if anyone has any questions, now's a great time to, to check those out there. Boy, carry on. Awesome. We have um, one question um, from Captain Cheddar 101. It says, should the sender or the receiver provide the incentive to the event relay service node? Yeah, that's that's a good question. We we settled on the sender being the one that should provide the incentive because the receiver doesn't necessarily know you or care about what you have to say, if that makes sense. Um, 
there are situations where you're being contacted by a stranger and it turns out you want to hear about what they have to say, but that's not true of everybody. So you don't really want the receiver paying for effectively spam calls. Does that, does that sort of make sense as a high level analogy? It's, if the sender pays, it kind of guarantees that what's being said is worth saying. Um, and that makes it a better for everybody rather than like call and collect on a, on a phone. Um, you're not necessarily going to pick up in that case. Yeah. Yep. They say check. So I think that that, that clears that up. Also, yeah. if there's anybody else, um, please feel free to post a comment and we will display it on the stream. Everyone says, yep, that, that's good. That's uh, so spam makes sense. What I love to hear. That's fantastic. Cool. All righty. Um, so I might take my time here just to make sure I'm explaining this right. So I think first what I'm going to do is describe the incentivized version of Event Relay. And then we can talk a bit about the why and the how after that. So essentially what happens here is the sender is providing compensation for the service to the node or the service provider in the middle. And um, this is actually harder than it seems because the sender and the node don't know each other. They're two computers on the internet, complete strangers, and they have no particular reason to trust one another. Um, and so you run into all these problems where if you wanted to be a bit cheeky as a sender, it's easy to design a system where it's possible. So the kind of things I'm talking about are sending messages that you would never intend to pay for would be one example. So you can kind of do the sort of ding dong bitch at a doorbell, right? You, you turn up to a door and knock on it and then run away and you've annoyed someone by conveniencing them. And in this case, you're asking this node, this service to do some work, but the service is never going to get compensated for that, um, which isn't really fair to them, right? So when you're designing how this works, you have to keep in mind the kinds of misbehavior that people could get up to if they wanted to either just troll or possibly attack the system maliciously, although that's you know, not, not particularly a concern. It's just something that you want to prevent from being a possibility in the first place. Um, and so this mechanism for payment between the sender and the node needs to be effectively trustless. Um, it doesn't need, it needs to not rely on a trust relationship between the sender and the node. Um, and that's part of why this is a, a trickier problem than it seems. Um, so the way, the way that this payment for the service is made is using the blockchain and smart contracts. And the rest of this talk is going to be explaining what that means at the highest level that is still useful. That's my goal with it. In the fourth talk, we're going to get into exactly how this works and hopefully satisfy some of those detailed questions. But for today, I'm hoping that we come out of this knowing what the moving parts are for, even if we don't necessarily know how they work or why, why they work in particular. Um, so that, that's the key point, is that this incentivizing of the node is done using the blockchain and using smart contracts. And so if we, if we think about the effect that this has, if, if, if nodes are now paid for providing the service, this is our trade-off from before with no incentives. So the node is essentially donating their time to do this. And their only motives are these altruistic, selfless ideas. Um, if we go to the incentivized version, we now have this other reason to provide the service, which is the service rewards, right? The, the compensation from the sender. And you can see that that tips the scale to this side for a lot more people. Um, the end result of that is that a lot more people are going to be interested in providing this service. Um, and that means that the network can scale and provide private decentralized comms to a lot more people than unincentivized systems. So that's that's the overarching point of this incentive stuff is we want more people to run these and be able to provide this decentralized infrastructure backbone um, for messaging. 
And the nice thing about the structure where the sender pays um, the node as work is performed is that if the demand goes up, the node or the service provider has to do more work. So the, the costs of providing the service go up, but also so do the benefits. And so this system has this nice symmetry where the more work you're doing, actually the better it is for the node. Um, so scaling isn't an issue anymore. It becomes more about technical constraints, which you can solve rather than fundamental, who's willing to do this constraints um, from a, an altruistic, selfless kind of voluntary system. So this, this is essentially a recipe for mainstream private comms. And I think that's the, the key point is that if you can solve scaling like this, you are onto a winner. That's, that's the theory of it. Now we might, I might just check on comments here because I'm about to go a bit deeper now. Is there anything, anything people want to ask Monty? Uh, yep, we have one question um, from um, Atlas Apples. Will people pay to send messages? We live in a world of free messaging, which is. Yeah. yeah. So, so this, this example that I'm showing here for the sake of clarity and simplicity, it's talking about direct payments from a device to the node. But what you might find is that at a level above the service, um, an app might actually provide relay for you in order for you to use their services. So you, you would still be able to get free comms by engaging with an app that wanted to you know, serve their content to you. It's just that now privacy is the default version of that deal and they have to ask you for any information that they want to monetize as part of that exchange. Whereas with a centralized service, it's kind of take it or leave it, right? If you want to use Facebook Messenger, they have your data and that's just a fact. You know, your, your app has no control over what it gives them. Whereas you can imagine on top of this service, all kinds of apps with different trade-offs between information sharing or pay as you go, various different business models are possible on top of this, including an advertising one, but it's much less uh, coercive because it's not all or nothing. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that answers that question. Cool. Thank you, Josh. Um, if there's any other questions, feel free to pop them into the chat and I will raise them when we have a slight um, break. But other than that, I think we're good. We can continue on. Nice. Um, so now, now we're going to get into the how a little bit. So if we, if we come back to the slide, there's this blockchain section here, which is what, uh, sort of handles, handles the incentivization. It's, it's sort of a, the thing that does the, the payments, but this is a concept that's quite complicated and often misunderstood or explained in strange ways. And I think that it's worth going into exactly what, uh, what's involved or sort of the properties of the blockchain that we care about for this, and just setting those out. And then giving a little example of a smart contract, which would actually do the incentivizing so that you can get a, an intuitive feel of the kind of thing that we're building um, with more detail on exactly what we're building coming in the fourth talk. So a blockchain is essentially, um, a public and tamper-proof record of events. So it's it's just a list of things that happened um, one after the other in time. And because it's tamper-proof, um, it's a really good way to store information that people would like to tamper with. Um, for example, whether or not a particular transaction, a uh, movement of funds from one place to another, if you could remove that from the list of things that happened, you would have more money, right? So people have a strong incentive to lie about that sort of thing. And because it's tamper proof, that's why you can do things like uh, tokens and decentralized finance and all that sort of stuff on a blockchain. Um, for similar reasons, it's also good at recording ownership of things. Um, exactly why it's tamper proof is a talk of its own. So we're not going to go into that. But I think if you can understand that it is, 
that there's no way for people to change what it says uh, in a cheating kind of way and lie about about what's happened, then you sort of get the essence of this that, that we need. And then built on top of the blockchain, or sort of an extension to that idea, is, is this concept of a smart contract. Um, and these are, these are really misunderstood. And so I'm going to take a second to explain some things that these are not. Um, so smart contracts are not digital contracts. So say, I don't know, like a tenancy agreement, I go and digitally sign something, right? That is not a smart contract. That's just a file with my signature in it. Um, so we're talking about something different. Um, smart contracts are essentially computer programs that run on the blockchain. Um, so the some uh, yeah, so some computation is done, um, and then information is written to the blockchain as a result, as like a new thing that happened. Um, so this means that you can do things like uh, logic, so like an, an if statement. Um, if the if my wallet contains more than ten ETH, then do this; otherwise, do that. Right? You can you can start to put conditional reasoning and you can do all the things that you can do with code, but you can do them with uh, information, quantities, and events that are stored on the blockchain. Um, and in the same way that the blockchain data is tamper-proof, like no one can lie and replace that information, the execution of this code is also tamper-proof. So people can't lie about the result of it and put that on chain. Um, and the code will run exactly as designed. Um, it could still be buggy, like they could design it wrong, but once it's there, it will faithfully execute the way that it was intended or the way it was written down in, in programming terms. So you can't lie about the outcome of a smart contract and include that on the blockchain. They always work as expected, um, with like bugs notwithstanding. Um, and that means that you can use the logic of a smart contract to build something that feels similar to a legal contract in real life. So a legal contract in real life is an agreement between two people about uh, what each of them will do in, in certain situations or like the outcome of, of the future. So you might think of a very simple legal contract as um, you know, a, a very informal one, for example, would be um, betting on a coin toss. You know, two people come forward with $10 and then you flip a coin, someone calls it, and whoever wins walks away with $20. You could write that up formally as a legal contract and then enforce that contract through the court system. The difference is with a smart contract, rather than using the courts to make sure that the outcomes happen, the code of the smart contract can write the outcomes to the chain and so cause, cause the outcome to happen based on the logic of that code. So it's sort of enforcing its own outcomes. It doesn't require um, a legal system to back them up. And that's the, the primary difference um, between a, a legal contract and a smart contract. Um, so we can talk about these um, in a bit more specific detail. We're going to use that coin toss example. So if you imagine writing code for the contract, it might be something like this. Step one would be collect um, the funds from both players. So two other people would send in 0 0.1 ETH into the contract. And then once the money's there, the so contract would run and generate a random number. So that random number is effectively the coin toss. And based on what that random number is, um, the smart contract can figure out who won, player one or player two. And then once that coin toss happens, the smart contract itself sends the 0.2 ETH from both people to the winner, right? Um, that's a very simple implementation of uh, something that you might be able to write a, a legal contract for. So it, it sort of shows that parallel. 
And, and one of the really interesting properties of this is that um, in real life, if, if you bet 20 bucks with someone on a coin flip, you're not actually guaranteed to get the money because it's still in their hand. They could just walk away, right? The, the enforcement of that comes down to, you know, trusting the other person to actually uphold their end of the deal. But because the smart contract takes custody of the funds in advance, as soon as the players send their fund that's out of their control, and the only thing that determines the outcome is the logic of this code in the middle. Um, so you end up with this situation where smart contracts can trustlessly enforce a set of rules. In this case, it's the rules of the coin flip. Um, and that ends up being really useful. If we take that as an example, it's not too much of a stretch to see that you might use this to write an incentive system that works in that same trustless way. So the, the players, uh, in this case, the, the service providers or the operators of this network would voluntarily join in. They would stake and get involved in the system. And then as soon as they've done that, the outcomes that happen are determined entirely by the logic of that, of that incentive system and how those nodes actually perform. So if you measure the performance of the, um, the service providers, then the smart contract can sort of arbitrate and make sure that the right outcomes happen in terms of the incentives, rewarding you know, good performance and um, providing a reason for nodes to be careful about bad performance. Um, and there's nobody that you need to trust in order for that outcome to happen. It's just automatic and safe because of how smart contracts and the blockchain work. So that's a lot to take in. Um, I hope that that made some sense because this is a very hard thing to describe without getting into the technical detail. Um, and I'd like to I'd like to have some back and forth about this to see how that landed and um, hear if you have any questions because there's a high chance that this bit didn't quite work, which is cool. Um, you know, definitely just a hard thing to explain. So let me know if there's anything you'd like to ask or um, check. Uh, we had a great comment um, from Hallyx that said, you can tell Josh is so smart that it's painful for him to dumb it down enough for me to understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, we do what we love. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that folks folks are getting it. Uh, it's, yeah, it's yeah. This definitely takes a minute. Like, I definitely didn't just pick this up when I read it the first time. You sort of need to digest it. Um, definitely. So yeah, just if anything comes to mind at any point about this stuff, feel free to ask it. Yeah, we're getting some great responses in the chat um, that you've explained it really well, Josh. So kudos to you. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. If there's any other questions, feel free to pop it in and we can, we can ask Josh more. Awesome. No, seem, seems all good in the chat. Everybody's, everybody's following you, so you're all good. That, that's kind of surprising, but very good news. <laughs> no, okay. um, I mean, we're, we're essentially at the end now um, of this talk. Hopefully, what I'm hoping we come away with today is that incentives are really important if you want decentralized comms to scale well. That's the key problem that this is solving. Um, and you can do that by making the benefits to service providers outweigh the costs. Um, the way that we actually achieve that is using smart contracts to create the rules of a game that all of the participants are playing. And because of the nature of smart contracts with blockchain, you can trust that those rules will be fair to everybody and behave exactly as they've been described. Um, and that's sort of the unique aspect of the blockchain and smart contracts, which means they're so important to this project. Um, in the next one, we're going to go into the detail. So there are three 
key areas where we use these ideas of trustlessness and um, incentives in the incentivized relay um, event relay protocol. And so I'm intending to go through each of those um, in a fair amount of depth. I wouldn't say like full technical depth just because we only have an hour at most. Um, but this will be the one where specific detailed questions are highly encouraged. So if, if anyone has any like how exactly does this work and they want to do a bit of thinking about, you know, digging into those details, um, I'm hoping for loads of questions and, you know, nice tangents coming off of the technical stuff in this, this talk. So if that's you, then come on to the next one. It should be good. Um, but yeah, the, the three areas, I guess I should explain those too. So there's that problem of trustlessly paying the node for work, which we're solving using something called probabilistic micropayments. There's allocating work to each service provider in a way that incentivizes them to, uh, you know, participate well and, and do a good job. And then there's also stuff to do with measuring the performance of the nodes when they're providing that service um, and using that measurement to incentivize good, good performance. So all of those, all of those areas we'll talk about next time. Yeah, I think that's all. Awesome. And um, we just had a quick question in the chat. Um, I'll pop it up here. So if a sender sends their messages to multiple service nodes, which one gets paid? Um, in short, uh, each of them. The, they're, yeah, the answer to this goes into a bit of detail that we'll cover next time. But essentially, if you're sending a message to a particular person, mm -hmm. it'll be routed through a particular uh, service provider. So you could you could set up a system where you use multiple for redundancy, but it's um, always clear which provider is responsible for fulfilling a particular request, essentially. Um, and then you can have some redundancy on top of that, that one-to-one -one relationship between receiver and node. Yeah. Hopefully that makes some sense. Awesome. Um, I've got another question here. Um, it says, okay, um, let's see if it shows up. Okay, uh, it says, oh, okay, well, let me show it fully here, so I'm just going to read it out. Um, I've got to ask again about the payment for messaging. If people need to pay to send messages and the key is to get getting people on board is, is for the applications using the silo network, pay for it and absorb the costs to their profits. Does that mean we won't be seeing silo as a standalone messaging system outside of specific application? How do you plan to convince people to use silo, thus allowing the network to scale and general usage outside of specific acts, assuming that is the goal? Yeah, so this, this goes a little bit beyond my direct expertise. So I'm probably only going to be able to answer this at a high level. Essentially, the idea is that we are going to provide um, an API or uh, more generally like an SDK, a development kit that lets anybody build the, the silo protocol messaging stuff into their own decentralized apps. So part of the vision for that is to build up a really nice onboarding process to get people able to use this stuff and build it in, and also to, to proof it in the context of um, the metaverse and, and you know communications for the metaverse, which has been a large focus of the, the wider project. So the the route to market is basically a combination of proving it works really well with um, some of these partner projects that we're working with and, and getting that all um, all working, and also essentially just allowing anybody who wants to use the service the alternative of not having to set up their own servers and do all the work associated with doing it themselves. Ideally, in the long run, it's going to be just easier to pick this up and um, provide comms to your users using the silo network on kind of a, a business to business sort of level without necessarily needing any individual user to know that their app uses this network. Um, you can, of course, pay as you go if you want. Like that's built into how this works as a possibility, but it's not necessarily the way that this will be used in the long run. Uh, yeah, Kevin, share the tickets are uh, that um, probabilistic micropayment idea. Those are the same thing. Um, so we're going to talk about those next week. Awesome.
and um okay cool so you've covered Captain Tudor. Um we'll take one last question before we will head off. Um so um Cam Bimbler said is relay traffic through nodes stoastic or is there weighing the more nodes you hold? Apologies, I'm dyslexic. So that word Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Sto stochastic. Yeah, so I, again, the, the full details of this are probably better for next week. Um, but there's, there is, oh, sorry, I just read a comment and got completely derailed. I know, <laughs> but, you know so I, I lose my hand thought so quickly. So, so the, the essence of it is that the more stake that your node has, sort of the, the bigger portion of the network that, that your node is, the more traffic that's allocated to it on average. So there's this uh, this pseudo random process of well, this is hard to explain quickly. Every receiver is mapped to a node, and it's done in a way where the number of receivers that each node gets should be about the same, with a little bit of randomness um, built in. And that randomness has good sort of privacy implications because it makes it harder to keep track of the communications history of any particular. Um, ID in the system. That's that's very tangential though. But essentially, the more stakes that you have, the more traffic you get, and the more traffic you get, the more that you have the potential to get the reward for providing the service. So there's this nice sort of if you buy into the network and if you sort of commit to the ideals and and you know you're there with um, the intent to stay for a while, then that gives you access to providing the service um, and the rewards that come with that. Hopefully that answers your question. All right. Um, I think that we are going to, oh, yeah, that's a really useful, thanks. Um, amazing. Well, I think that we are going to wrap it up there. Um, but before we leave, uh, we do have, it, it, it is the time that you have all been waiting for. It is POAP time. So Josh, what word would you like to choose? Oh, this went really poorly last time. <laughs> yeah, it did actually. Like there was a couple of people that were saying like event relay and then decentralized comms. Oh, I th okay. The it's chat is a, a good one. Yeah. And I'm almost mad because you're trying to make me say this word again, which I just butchered. <laughs> yeah. Stoastic. Close. Yes. Dot. Chastic. Yeah. It's, what is it, stochastic? It's, yeah, it's one of those stats words. You, if you've seen it before, you've probably been to uni, I'm guessing, but oh, there you go. I am not tertiary educated, guys. This is very difficult for me. Um, stochastic. Okay, that made it easier to understand. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be our uh, POAP word today. So if you would like to claim a POAP for our chat, please head over to Discord, open a ticket, spam us with this word, and we shall get no, <laughs> the word. Um, but uh, yes, uh, thank you again, everybody, for coming. Um, it's been wonderful, our third and not yet final we have one more um, conversation that we will be having after this one. And if you have been enjoying our um, our chats um, and our presentations, please, uh, if you've got any um, ideas on what you'd like to hear about next, if there's any, um, any concepts or systems that you're unsure of um, that we can help explain and... Um, and do a kind of like, you know, long form discussion about them and give you the opportunity to ask questions. Like, please post it up in the Discord. Um, yeah, and absolutely. other ideas and feedbacks channel. And we would love to, you know, after this series, uh, it's not going to stop here. Like, there's so much more to cover. Um, and like, we're, we're merely scratching the surface. So um, it would be really, really awesome if you've got any, um, yeah, ideas, suggestions, pop it into our, um, our 
Discord and that would be great. Um, speaking of Discord, we also have a bunch of um, exciting events coming up. Uh, we have, like I said before, the um, Halloween um, Furry Friends competition. So if you have a pet and you want to dress them up and post it on the internet for us to enjoy, I would very much appreciate that and you will be rewarded. Um, and we also have um, our fourth and final chat is actually not going to be in two weeks' time. nah -uh. We're going to hold you back, and on the 18th of November, um, 11 a.m. NZT, we will be, um, it's the 18th, yeah, we are going to be doing, um, we're going to be doing this chat, the, the, the fourth and final chat. Um, yes, Josh is a very busy man. We have to book him in years in advance. So literally, I mean, this chat was literally a year in advance. We have been like. <laughs> We've really been showing on this for a while, huh? It's so good to finally do it. And actually, it's, it's, so, it's just so cool to see all the engagement. People are, are really asking some good questions. So it's, yeah. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, so it's been really good. So, yeah, we've got we've got uh, that activation, the Furry Friends activation coming up on Discord. We have, before I forget, um, our Halloween spooky stream uh, coming up tomorrow. So if you want to win some prizes, if you want to play Dead by Daylight with Som and I, please join that. It's going to be fun. Um, there may be a poet to be claimed. <laughs> How do we, maybe? Uh, but uh, yeah. Other than that, Josh, any final remarks? Any dad jokes? Anything that you'd like to leave us on before we don't see you for like three weeks? My dog's literally crying in the corner there about it. <laughs> uh, just thank you. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And yeah, looking forward to the next one. Amazing. Oh, Awesome. All righty. Um, we will see you later. Thank you so much, everybody, and goodbye. Yeah. Bye, Josh. Bye.